This is why, if you notice, all these Mughals also, because they were Persianized, they, were, they came from Persian culture, they're very interested in astrology. Astrology is not common in the Islamic world, but it is very common in Central Asia. Why? Because it is the influence of Iran and it is the influence of India. And they both believed in the Mahurat, in the Shubdin, in the skies, in the celestial. We didn't have, for example, horses in India. Horses are not native. In fact, even after the Indo-Europeans came, even after the Greeks and Huns came, even after the Mughals came, horses would have to be imported in India because India's climate is such that horses are, don't naturally uh, multiply. Uh, they don't, uh, they're not disease free. So we have to keep importing horses. But we know that the Indo-Europeans had horses, not only horses, but their chariots. Whereas we don't find any such evidence in uh, Indus Valley. So we don't find evidence of that. Damn. We don't find ex evidence of any town planning or modern cities in the uh, after that period, after 1500 BC. We'd invited Mohsen Raza Khan on the show to teach us about the history of Islam and Sufism. And that's how this particular conversation began. Eventually, we realized that it's a 101 on the history of religion in general. We've spoken about every religion that originated in Asia in this one. So if you're someone who enjoys knowing much more about culture, knowing about real history, unlike most history textbooks that are used in schools today, you've got to understand that history is fragmented. We're constantly rediscovering history. And the only way to know real, truthful, impactful history is by learning from the experts. Mohsen Raza Khan is one of those experts, one of the most well-read people you've had on the show. I'm sure he's going to become a TRS All-Star. We recorded another bunch of fantastic episodes after this one. Highly recommend that you watch this particular one till the end. For more episodes just like this, make sure you follow TRS on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive. Every episode's available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Before I let you slip into this fantastic conversation, I want to highlight that our meditation app level is now live on the App Store and the Play Store. We link it down below. Make sure you go download it. Make sure you begin your yoga, meditation, and health-oriented journeys. And now we have one of the year's best history episodes with Mohsen Raza Khan. Hello everyone, we have found a TRS All-Star. This is Mohsen Raza Khan. Sir, thank you for being on the show. Um, when we had scheduled you as a guest, we thought we'll do a whole special on Islam. And the more I talk to you outside, uh, the more I've gotten to know you, I feel that you have so many subjects to offer. You also told me that in order to truly understand the story of Islam, you need to understand what the world was like before uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism really originated. So I think for this episode, we're going to do a history of religions uh, special. Hmm. Uh, I want to begin with a simple question. How are you, sir? I'm great. I'm very happy to be here, Ranveer. Okay, so we were having a very interesting conversation about uh, Islam in general, the origins of it. And um, the nature of Arabia in general, the Gulf in general, before Islam. Where would you like to begin this story, sir? Because I think our listeners, our viewers know a lot about Indian culture and Hinduism and Buddhism. But I was waiting for the right kind of guest to help us learn about Islam. And we're glad to have you on. So Glad to be here. So um, I would begin the story of uh, Islam, you know, in the pre-Islamic Arabia. Okay. That is, um, you know, we don't know things for certain uh, in, uh, in antiquity, in the ancient world, when things happened exactly. And uh, we believe that uh, Prophet Muhammad was born around 570 CE, common era, or in the old way, AD. And uh, what was uh, Middle East like when he was born? What was uh, especially that area which he was born? So uh, today, Saudi Arabia, and even at that time, the Arabian Peninsula could be divided into a few parts. The two main parts are the Hijaz and the Najd. The Najd is the central desert, you know, the area around Riyadh, etc. 
and the hijaz is the red sea coast so mecca medina jeddah they come in the area of hijaz so prophet muhammad was born in this area uh, he was born in mecca in a tribe uh, called the quraish and uh, within that tribe there was a subgroup called the banu hashim the house of hashim uh, and uh, he was born in it um, to a gentleman called uh, abdullah his mother's name was amina and um, unfortunately he was uh, or has fate would have it he was orphaned his father passed away uh, even before uh, he was born mother passed away at 6 years of age um, he goes to live in the house of his grandfather uh, abdul muttalib for 2 years then the grandfather also passes away and he goes to live in the house of his uncle uh, Abu Talib this is the story um now what exactly was the pre-existing um, religion of this part of the world so these people would uh, be normally categorized as uh, paganism that is they believed in a large number of gods um they had a deity called Hubal who was a Syrian god uh, of the moon Mm, they believed in uh, three daughters uh, called uh, uh, you know derived from the egyptian isis one of them and was the egyptian religion still around at this point like in the gulf as well very interesting so egypt had already by this time converted to christianity coptic christianity <clears throat> but egypt's influence had been there because these were neighboring civilizations so uh, their gods and goddesses some of them had arabian forms in fact um it is believed that the kaaba housed 360 idols these 360 idols were uh, idols of the various tribes that occupied arabia uh, most of this area was not settled territory arabs that is bedouins were a tribal people each one had their own gods and goddesses um um uh, so what happened was that some of these uh, arabs had now become sedentary they had settled down uh, some in um, yemen of course yeah, yemen had had a civilization for hundreds of years before that but even in this area that is in the mecca area medina area agriculture had arrived in some oasis towns and then mecca was of course a trading and religious center so some arabs or some bedouins had settled down into sedentary life and as you know these are different stages of civilization tribal societies are usually considered more primitive uh, they are simpler life is more of a struggle and once you get down to sedentary life your life becomes more assured you have assured sources of water food etc your prosperity increases so your demands also change of your society your society becomes more hierarchical mm. um, and it's no longer equal in the same way so what we have here is um, a large number of tribes um they are bordered by two large empires one is the empire of the iranians uh, sasanian empire these are zoroastrians on the other side you have the byzantine empire that is basically a, a, a eastern orthodox christianity they occupy the areas of syria palestine uh, all of that area anatolia <coughs> and also uh, parts of egypt um Uh, the iranians occupy what is most of iran uh, all the way up to iraq uh, this area is the area of hijaz najd this is ruled by local tribes and below that they have some kind of a, in yemen they already have some kind of civilization and kingdoms etc on the other side of the red sea also you have christians because abyssinia which is today's ethiopia has already become christian and it has a christian king etc so you have an atmosphere of uh, quite a lot of diversity i would say multi religious atmosphere christians and christian communities are also there in arabia but more like individual christians are there um but these their christianity would not be recognizable say to a european christian because they follow different uh, sects nestorians coptic etc um zoroastrians are there in small numbers and then large communities of jews are there because what has happened is that already the diaspora has taken place that is jews have had uh, two waves 
large, uh, I'm talking about two large waves, the other, of uh, destruction. One was when um, the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar II, invaded Palestine, Israel, and he drove them out and took them as some of them as slaves. <clears throat> then Cyrus the Great of Iran, uh, Persia. Who's um, shown in 300. I think his kid is, his <laughs> son is shown in 300. Uh, a, caricature, a caricature of him. It's not really him, you know. They, they made up, much of 300 is uh, kind of made up film. Okay. But yeah, kind of they, they denote him. So uh, exactly, yeah. This Cyrus name has come up a lot uh, uh -huh. in my history books, uh -huh. amongst my Parsi friends, of right, course. Right, right, right. Um, he was a Zoroastrian king? Yeah, and he was an amazing king, actually. Uh, people don't know his story. He was an amazing man because he uh, did not use slave labor at all, uh, which is very unusual in the ancient world. Okay, Everybody, including from India to the West, everybody's using slave labor. You can call it by different names. You can mm. call them dasas or whatever mm. you want to call them. Okay? This guy never used slave labor. Paid he, his army. He paid every laborer, not just army, his laborers he paid, all who constructed everything. Not mm. only that, he freed the Jews. So Jews had been brought as slaves by Nebuchadnezzar II to Babylon. He defeats Nebuchadnezzar, takes over Babylon, and he frees them. He says, you are free to go. So what happens is not everybody returns to Palestine or Israel. Many of them settle in our surrounding areas. Some of them come to Arabia also, settle in Medina, Mecca, etc., etc. And they, they are very skilled people because they are from a more advanced civilization. So they know agriculture, which mm. Arabs don't. So they take over some of the best agricultural lands in the oasis in Medina. They take over, uh, they, they are very good in jewelry and crafts, hands, handicrafts. They, they're very good at making weapons because they come from more advanced civilization. So they, uh, they have also learning. But really the large wave of them comes in the second wave. That is when the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire also, as I mentioned, took over all of this area. Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Syria, all of this area. So what they do is that there is a rebellion in Israel. And after the second or third rebellion, they just destroy the temple at Jerusalem and they expel all the... Jews. That's how you get the Jewish diaspora in Europe, etc. Okay. And some of these diaspora Jews also come to Arabia and they settle in. So there's a two-wave migration. Some older, some later. <clears throat> but they are obviously, and uh, they have writing. Uh, our, the, uh, Arabs also have writing, but their Jewish uh, script have a scripture. So every religion doesn't have a scripture. Uh, now, uh, I'll get a little bit definitional. That is, what is scripture? Is Scripture is like the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas. Only more advanced civilizations, that is, civilizations which have had agriculture, etc., and have have writing and uh, organized religion, they, they develop a scripture. Actually, the incident comes from Cyrus. One of the incidents comes from Cyrus. So, or around this, you can say is around 500 BCE. And Cyrus says to the Jews that, uh, where is your scripture? Do you have something in writing in your religion? And the Jews still don't have. They say, no, sir, we don't have a written scripture. That means it was still a largely oral tradition of the Judaic people, but in in uh, contact with the more advanced civilization, that is Iran, they also then uh, codify their scripture and uh, write down the Torah, etc. <clears throat> it may have come earlier, these stories, but they were not written down. Just like Homer's stories, Homer's stories initially were just oral stories. Mm -hmm. They were not written down. They, they were written down I think later. that's the case with most of the ancient world. It was mostly oral. Even the Vedas, it's interesting, were orally transmitted. Yeah. So a Brahmin would sit with young Brahmin boys and he would instruct them to memorize and recite in a particular way. And that's why the recitation of the Vedas is more or less the same whether you go to Kashmir or you go to Kanyakumari. Because it has been orally taught in the precise way, the meter. And uh, that's the way to preserve it. How did like the rest of the world, which is the Roman Empire, parts of Africa, the Gulf, uh, maybe even Russia, how did all of them look at the Indian civilization? Like, was it truly as advanced? As we're told, because one thing I've learned about a lot of historians is everyone has kind of their own opinions on things. Mm. But I'd like to just, I'd like to know yours as well. See, there was not that much contact with India because India was quite far off from, say, Europe or China. And it was uh, walled off by the Himalayas and huge seas, etc. And, uh, and the Iranian uh, Zagros Mountains and all of that, Hindu Kush. So there was not that much contact. Uh, but... There was also some contact. There were some Indian traders who would go into the Central Asia. There was... Uh, so, uh, uh, Indians had also kind of become more inward looking. They were not... Uh, because of the nature of the geography. Yeah. Uh, they were isolated and, and India was a kind of a dwipa, you know, an island kind of... I believe they started looking eastwards. Yeah. So, what happens is that India really uh, takes off um, 
with the arrival of Buddhism. Because as the Buddhism is a more of a missionary religion. See, some religions are not that missionary. Buddhism was a more missionary, so it used to send out monks. It, uh, a lot of people got converted in Central Asia, in China, etc. And that also, and by this time also, uh, the Greeks had arrived on our borders, thanks to Alexander. So there was a lot of interaction with the Greeks, and the Greeks had a whole civilization because of Alexander's conquest, stretching across the Middle East into Europe, North Africa, etc. So, thanks to the Greek kingdoms that came up, thanks to the Buddhists, and of course, it's not to say that uh, there was not Hindu, uh, what we today call Hindu, I mean, Hindu is a modern term, relatively speaking, comes from Persia, let's call it Vedic civilization. Uh, this civilization uh, also had a spread uh, both to Southeast Asia with our traders, just as Buddhism spread to Southeast Asia from India. But also, uh, uh, see, our, uh, also uh, we had a partner civilization. See, Persia is actually India's partner. We, we are actually two brothers from the same mother. Okay. That is, the two closest languages are uh, ancient Persian, which is called you know Zendavesta, and old Sanskrit. So old Persian. And old Sanskrit come from the same root, the Proto-Indo-European language. Is it this? Uh, is it the same as like how Zoroastrianism and Indian cultures have a lot of parallels? The re this is the reason because they come from the same root. So actually, what was the Vedic religion originally? It was a fire sacrifice religion. There were no temples. People used to sit around a fire, have grass on which you would be seated, and pour sacrifices into the fire. The smoke of the sacrifices would go to your ancestors and to the devas. Devas means the same word as Deus in mm. Greek, the shining ones. The root is the same, Indo-European, old Indo-European. Devas is Deus. And the, it's going to your ancestors. So that's why Iran's religion, ancient religion, was also a fire religion. Because they come from the same source. What happens is that a prophet emerges in Iran called Zarathustra. We don't know the exact date. It is, could be as early as 1000 BC. We don't know. Is this Zoroaster? Zoroaster, which we now know as Zoroaster. So Zarathustra was, a, uh, was actually a predecessor for all the Semitic religions, by which I mean he was a predecessor for Judaism, for Islam, and for Christianity. Why? Because he's the first guy who says, I'm a prophet, a, ki a kind of prophet, a messenger from God. He says that there are two forces, good and evil, in the world. Yeah. But they come from the same source. The original Zoroastrians believed that there was a person in the sky called Ahura Mazda. This word is very interesting because Ahura comes from Asura, mm. the same root. In Persian, the word S could not be pronounced and it was replaced by H everywhere. So Asura becomes Ahura. That means you can imagine that their original religion before Zoroastrianism, mm. no, there's nothing original, but their earlier religion, let's put yeah. it this way, was similar to Vedic Hinduism because Asuras are in Vedic Hinduism and their gods also have the similar names, uh, Mitra, uh, Varuna, uh, you know, so they have the same kind of gods, Indra, that we in India's Vedic civilization had, the early uh, yeah. Vedic civilization. I think we're talking about the seed religion, which was common to both India exactly. and, and Persia. So they are actually like our brothers in the sen in that sense, civilizationally speaking. Yeah. Mm. So, so the thing is, and this is why, if you notice, all these Mughals also, because they were Persianized, they, were, they came from Persian culture, they're very interested in astrology. Astrology is not common in the Islamic world. But it is very common in Central Asia. Why? Because it is the influence of Iran and it is the influence of India. And they both believed in the Mahurat, in the Shubdin, in the skies, in the celestial uh, bodies. Uh, uh, and everything would be done according to that, predictions would be made. And that's why they had very good relationships, the Mughals, with the uh, Hindu pundits, astrologers, with, um, with even some um, Hindu sects like the Goraknathis, etc. So even when Zoroaster comes, he doesn't completely destroy the old religion because nothing comes out of nothing. Everything has a past from which a new thing evolves. So he keeps the fire religion, the fire sacrifice, the, but he transforms it. That's why the Parsis also have fire temples mm. where the fire is burning. Mm. Fire is very critical. For us also in India, Agni is very important. The sacrifice to Agni. In fact, Agni is so important that no uh, ceremony can happen, not marriage can happen, not Death can happen, not uh, uh, any of the sacrifice can happen without Agni. In fact, Agni is so important that North India would not exist without Agni. Mm. Because when the Aryans came originally, this whole Gangetic Valley, this is another part of our uh, environmental history that we don't know. The whole Gangetic Valley was covered in thick forest. And 
uh, you know, hunter gatherers or ancient men, uh, even nomadic people, did not have the power to chop down millions of acres of forest. So what would they do? They would set it on fire. We burn down millions of acres of forest to make it into farmland, mm -hmm. rich farmland. And that's how the Indo-Gangetic Valley was cleared. There were two paths that the Aryans took. One was called the Uttarapath, starting from whatever, Punjab, Haryana, stretching up to Bengal. The other is called the Dakshinapath. That is, again, starting from Punjab, Haryana, but coming down through Gujarat into Maharashtra and South. So th these were the two routes that they took. But this route was relatively okay. You know, there was not that much vegetation. But that one required Agni. And that's why Agni is so important. So, yeah. Um, I have some questions, sir. And I'm asking you these questions because till this point, we only had historians on the show who are completely against the Aryan theory. Mm. And for me, the show is a medium to learn myself. Like it's replaced my need for books. I barely read books. I talk to experts instead. Because I feel you guys have filtered knowledge from thousands of books that you've read. You know, you as a guy, when you're thinking, you look down. So they say that people who look towards the side learn because of hearing. People who look up, like myself, learn because of visual. And people who look down learn through books. <laughs> so uh, I okay. would like to know yeah. from all the books that you've read, yeah. uh, if the Aryan theory is true, and I'm not countering you here. I'm just trying to... Yeah. grasp. The if you're no countering me, it's even better. So my students counter me all the time and I love it. No, so, but I just, I, I want to know more about sure. it. Sure. So first of all, this term Aryan has become sort of unacceptable after, since Hitler abused it so much. Mm. So we use the term Indo-European uh, mm. more commonly. Okay. And uh, the there's a lot of now uh, evidence, both from genetic studies and linguistic studies. These are the two major forms. That is, uh, through linguistic studies, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have been able to figure out uh, where do languages originate, roughly, and how they evolved. So we know that there is an Indo-European group of languages which spreads or stretches from Bangladesh in the east all the way to Ireland in the west, geographically. That is, there was some proto-Indo-European language from which these emerged. They mixed with local tongues, maybe, but they emerged from there. For example, in India, we use the, you know, the uh, sound, ra. Now, ra is not an Indo-European sound. It comes most likely from Dravidian. Okay. The word ra. You know, it's khada hai hmm. and stuff, stuff like that. Or the uh, ra in Marathi. Or yeah. I believe even Malayalam has a ra. Yeah. So, so all of those are not Indo-European. They're not found in other Indo-European languages. So we assume that it was from a local tongue. Now, this language, Proto-Indo-European, probably emerged around the Caspian Sea area. You know, uh, one theory is it, it emerged around the Ca Caspian but Sea. Where area. is that geographically? Southern Russia. You could say, yeah, Southern Russia. You could say, um, um, yeah, the steppes somewhere around okay. that area, around the Caspian Sea, the Southern Russia, you would say, yeah, mm. around that area. Mm. Or Northern um, uh, Anatolia, also northern Anatolia. Turkey, say, uh, Russia. Yeah, that border area around the, just north of the Caucasus, uh, okay. around that area. Mm. Uh, and um, the, what we believe is that uh, some groups went to the west. And from there emerged the, the European languages, you know, Greek, Latin, Germanic languages, etc. Slavic languages. Uh, Celtic languages. Uh, all the way up to Ireland. Uh, a second group came, what is called the Indo-Persian group, Indo-Iranian group, from which emerges all of these languages, uh, you know, ancient Iranian, uh, Pashto, uh, the Kurdish language. And in, in fact, you would be surprised that uh, the first time we hear of uh, uh, Sanskrit is not in India. The first find we find written uh, is uh, from northern Syria. That is, you know, kings such as Asurbanipal. From their names, you can recognize that they would be, they would have common ancestors with uh, Indian, uh, Indo-Europeans, Asurbanipal, etc. and all that. All the way up in, uh, you know, uh, Mesopotamia and Syria. As in like the evidence we found? So the, there are two kinds of evidence. One is linguistic evidence. So what we do is we do computer modeling. Okay. They try to retrace depending on the language connections, where the proto-language must have come from. So, for example, there'll be some connection the the indian uh, indo european languages such as gujarati marathi punjabi etc etc bengali and all they are all related uh, in Hind we would say these are uh, uh, upper bramsh that is we uh, these are prakrits that is the sanskrit mixing with the 
the proto sanskrit mixing with the local tongues mm. and its local variations becomes gujarati somewhere somewhere something so these are and they are related to each other that is why many indians can at least in the border areas understand each other because the these languages are cousins of each cousins other. of each other whereas it would be difficult to understand the dravidian languages for a indo european speaker if he is not familiar with it mm. and of course similarly the dravidian languages also though they are distinct there is there is some connection between them mm. as a group of languages uh and by the way there are uh, just to explain to you that actually at some point the dravidian languages probably covered the whole of the indian subcontinent including pakistan including north india really? how do we know this we know this yeah because uh, there is there are still islands left of dravidian languages there is an island of dravidian language in balochistan in pakistan it's called brahvi brahvi is a dravidian language but it's still spoken by small groups of people in uh, balochistan and we can imagine that at some time it was more in the past it was more widespread similarly in the so indo gangetic place basically it's a language something like tamil or malayalam mm. but spoken in pakistan yes yes and in fact even in the indo gangetic plain there is a language called malto okay um i don't know if it's still spoken but it was spoke, spoken until fairly recent times and uh, malto again is a dravidian language so we know that uh, in fact also many of the languages spoken by tribals in uh, uh, are usually uh, so there there's another there's a third group of languages also in india uh it goes by different names but uh, some people call it the khmer group because it is related to what's spoken in khmer in cambodia it's a eastern uh eastern group of languages so you can find them also among tribal populations in india and some tribal populations speak some kind of a mixture of khmer and dravidian that means these po- population groups and these people were there for a long time much yeah. possibly before with uh, the aryan invasion theory i think the counter to that theory is that uh, during the the last ice age basically most of the earth was not habitable hmm. so people settled along uh, the persian stretch and in india and then once the ice age started withering away hmm. people started going to europe uh <laughs> okay so i i don't okay. i mean this is the theory that has come up on the show a lot okay uh i yeah. would like to know what you think because i think yeah. your theory is that when you get out of africa you settle down at the caspian sea and then two groups emerge from we there. don't know no i'm not saying we get out of africa and settle at the caspian sea so we don't know what the uh, proto origins of these people are okay uh, so out of africa we may have come you know considering we have found skeletons that are you know 200,000 100 to 200,000 years old uh, uh and we have now recently in fact in morocco found uh, uh, skeletons which are maybe 300,000 years old the, the so human origins which were considered only to be about 100,000 years have now been pushed back to about 300,000 or more and out of africa several waves have come out of africa also several waves have come out um and there are all kinds of speculations also now because Neanderthals were already occupying parts of Eurasia even before Homo sapiens arrived. When we are talking about humans, we are actually talking only about Homo sapiens sapiens, mm. right? When we are saying hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand, but even older than that are other humanoids yeah. such as Neanderthals, such as uh, there, there are so many. Yeah, people don't understand is that there was a whole phase in history where Homo sapiens coexisted along with all their cousins at yeah. the same time. Yeah. so you would see humanoids like yourself yeah. just nearby slightly different from you but yeah yeah, yeah. So, slightly different yeah, from because you because neanderthal won't look exactly like a homo sapiens even nor would a denisovian look like mm. one and there are others also but uh, but uh, possibly we eliminated them or um, in fact the theory is that we also cross bred with uh, them the females of the species at least because their dna is present in us in our dna how they arrived and what happened here exactly but we know that there was a complete change in india's civilization that is indus valley was a very advanced civilization you know there was plumbing indoor water there was a lot of trade ships manufacturing of goods uh, highly complex agriculture beautiful c- town planning citadels i mean the works it was just as advanced as anything say in mesopotamia etc but we suddenly find cities disappear how do we know this because uh, Uh, historians archaeologists dig straight down mm. and each layer of the earth tells you about a period of human civilization so you can mm. therefore know by how much you're digging as to what date you are at and you can also do carbon dating for that uh, which is a different p- process you can um, once you dig up you uh, uncover um, both inorganic matter that is artifacts etc which can help you date 
and you know what is the sophistication of the civilization of its settlements etc you can also look at organic matter because uh, you can look at what grains they were eating what uh, how those grains were cooked or not cooked you can look at i mean a variety of uh, 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 the remains of their uh, domesticated animals you can look at so what we discover is actually cities disappear in india mm. we don't find cities after around 1500 bc that means it's a civil now what is happening is that civilization has probably reverted to something more simpler maybe a village life or maybe a nomadic life or whatever we don't find evidence of large scale cities now unless somebody discovers that somebody digs up and shows us that we believe that there has been a change there must have been some big events possibly cataclysmic yes of course but we don't know we uh, can't say unless we have the evidence so yeah. yes you're right this could be a very plausible explanation i'll give you my romantic theory mm. and this is a theory no, not shaped from just the people who talk about indian history and culture mm. uh, even when i've spoken to archaeologists who have uh, studied africa mm. through the show and this is just stuff i've learned through the show i feel civilization is much older than we think could be the truth is that things just get destroyed over time like uh, mm. the only things that actually can survive the test of time are stones like the pyramids mm -hmm. like ancient stone structures mm. uh and i also constantly feel that there are regular cataclysmic events um because of which civilization just gets boiled down to simplicity very well true could be possible but the thing is that you know it would leave some physical trace so i mean and once you start digging uh, you would find some trace even if they even if the culture is not literate so first of all you could find script you could find fragmentary evidence even if you don't find that you could find objects you know pottery etc uh, you could find grains as i said organic matter if you're not finding anything and then uh, you know to speculate that it was destroyed and recreated i mean you know then you can believe in anything we have to believe at least i would and most scholars would like to base their theory on some kind of evidence you know some kind of um, do you think the indian government needs to do more work in terms of digging yeah in fact it should open india up to not only indian scholars but to uh, from all over the world let them come let them dig you know yeah. that in fact our most of our history is because of the british yeah. they are the ones who discovered indus valley they are the ones who discovered ashoka we didn't know about ashoka they are the ones who deciphered the scripts they are the ones who uh, dug up the monuments they are the ones who told us so if they were you know so uh, dangerous for us and i i agree with some people who say that look the history writing was done a bit from the british perspective okay but they also laid the foundations for what we have today we won't we didn't know about ashoka ashoka was forgotten in india yeah. um so was uh, the indus valley it makes you think of how many other kings or kingdoms or teachings are also forgotten mm -hmm. um do do a lot of it now we have also rediscovered so since then we have also done a lot of work so it's not like we have just completely forgotten we're not depending only what the british did we have our own scholars have been working on this which is why rather than attaching emotional or religious angles to history you should attach uh, research evidence uh, more investment in archaeology exactly mm. we need more young minds more well trained scholars more uh, skilled people to look at it technology you know use technology so um so 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 we don't uh, uh, use these terms anymore aryan invasion etc but indo europeans came we know this from the physical evidence we know from the changes that have taken place to the uh, to the physical evidence in the landscape we know it also from their uh, evidence that um, we didn't have for example horses in india horses are not native in fact even after mm -hmm. indo europeans came even after the greeks and huns came even after the mughals came horses would have to be imported in india because india's climate is such that horses are, don't naturally uh, multiply uh, they don't uh, they're not disease free so we have to keep importing horses but we know that the indo europeans had horses not only horses but their chariots whereas we don't find any such evidence in uh, indus valley so we don't find evidence of that Damn. we don't find so we don't find ex evidence of any town planning or modern cities in the uh, after that period after 1500 bc So you, so you, there's a, a range of plus the language. The language is the biggest uh, giveaway, which makes me think that all these stories we read about in Amar Chitrakatha with horses, then where did the horses go, <laughs> and where did they come from that time? If if you know those Amar Chitra sto Amar Chitrakatha stories are truly tens of thousands or lakhs of years old, at least something so amazing that even you know kingdoms in the south of India. Uh, Vijayanagaram, etc., Kakatiyas, etc. 
they would import they would import horses they would there would be thousands of turks living there in the deccan because they were bringing the horses there they were also serving as soldiers we have a much longer history than we we imagine with central asia with others etc and uh, and it's not just the indo europeans coming there after that also there have been many waves of invasions the huns came in you know the white huns which we call in india uh, the the term for hun is in west is you must have heard it scythian or mm. scythian mm. Mm. but in india we call them saka or shakya in fact buddha is called sakya muni he is the muni of the sakyas it is interesting that they had spread so far that is all the way up to bihar and nepal they had spread where, where so, are the huns from geographically so uh, so there are two types of huns the white huns uh, and uh, others and they basically come from central asia so and they invaded not just india they invaded iran they invaded uh, west uh, ukraine they invest, invaded all the cities so, so so we have a much longer history of uh, and the greeks then the greeks arrive and you know they are at our borders and they come in so there have been waves of people coming in uh, and at some point even the dravidians must have come in right it's not like maybe they maybe they took the coastal route you know along the coast even before the dravidians there are other people that arrived which uh, the kind of people that you sometimes find uh, on the andaman and nicobar islands you know uh, um, you know and uh, you also find them in parts of interior forests of india so you have waves of people coming in you know so humanity is there's nothing such as pure humanity or purity of a civilization yeah. etc it's all a mixture yeah i think i think religion if you if you read sapiens by yuval noah harari he keeps saying how all religions irrespective of what your religion or your belief is is a way to control large masses of people and at some point you have to detach yourself from what you emotionally feel for your own religion and look at human history in a scientific manner as human history look at it unemotionally look at it from an archaeological evidence based perspective and that's how you'll get a deeper learning of yourself as a human being so uh that's the only kind of cautionary uh sentence i want to put out there for our listeners because i know that there's a lot of people who are completely closed down to all these ideas you're pitching and in saying that i want to say that you're one of the most interesting guests i've ever had on the show <laughs> so we began uh speaking about the pre-islamic world and we've gone right up till india and amar chitra katha so i got to bring you back but, to but, the gulf but india is part of the pre-islamic world this is the most interesting one see this is what i'm saying you know everything is connected i mean how do you expect that the khmer tongue and austroasian austro meaning eastern eastern asian tongue is being spoken in india that means at some point there was a migration from there correct from where from somewhere there in the in in southeast asia or mm. whatever because if people in the northeast of india and the east of india also are speaking uh, a khmer related language that means things are mixed you know things are not, this this uh, this crazy search for purity everywhere and it's everywhere you know it's in it's in U- united states nowadays the whole trump thing is actually about purity right the whole thing is that whites are realizing especially lower income whites so it's partly economics that is they feel left out second they also feel that their nation is changing in a way that they can't recognize it. the mm-hmm. browning of america as they as, say as russell peters says eventually all of us are going to be beige <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, i hope so. That, so that's that's what happens in history right like I eventually so. you all just mm-hmm. form one big globule which is why i think if you study the indian uh, gene code we're a very complex mix yes. it's probably why we we the earliest to become beige Exactly. India is one of the most mixed you are absolutely right. And and the, what we have to understand is that look how is our language or uh, uh we uh, by by languages i mean say these north indian prakrits that we speak of how are they so closely related to uh persian or to uh, pashto etc we have to try to understand this it's uh, it can't be a fluke right it they must have been some kind of a, so computer modeling can tell us actually how these languages go back you can do a retracing of the language how these prakrits emerge and how at what point must uh, sanskrit have s- split from old persian old zendavast uh, uh 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 that old persian language and old sanskrit how they must have split how before that they must have been a proto indo european language from which the western indo european split that is the greek latin etc i mean this split when you keep recreating you go to that area around the caspian sea and also of course you have physical evidence also because you have ex- you have uh, burial chambers you have jewelry weaponry 
chariots you when you dig you find there so you have the the remnants of the culture the physical remnants of the culture you have the linguistic evidence of the culture otherwise how do you have sanskrit being written in northern syria you know now you can take a nationalist position and you can say this is all uh, rubbish and actually everything came out because of the ice age from india and we but you know kind of the computer modeling on linguistics or the physical evidence doesn't yeah. testify like the moment you completely discount any theory your capacity to learn also stops that's what i feel exactly. like just keep yourself open keep yeah. room for changes even in the mindset that you've already adopted completely correct which is, which is why i struggle a lot to talk to um a lot of older folks in india for some reason and i'm not just talking about right wing folks or left wing folks everyone who's older As everyone who's older wants to be set in their ways you see the he, and by older i mean actually it starts pretty early it starts in your teens itself the most open are children okay then teenagers and then youth because the older you get the more set you are in your ways and there is a concept in uh, we use it in ir also in international relations called uh, ontological security cognitive security now i know i'm using very complex no word, go for it but ontology just means reality so what is your view of reality so what does religion do religion gives you a view of reality what is real and what's not real for example we find ourselves as uh, the german philosopher heidegger used to say thrown into the world that is when we awake we find ourselves in the world as a stranger right so what do we do we take whatever our parents and our societies told us about reality and accept that because it tells us a story and it quietens our uh, disturbance our agitation so that there is no cognitive dissonance so that now we feel calmer this is a story of how this camera came into existence you came into existence i came into existence these plants animals i have a story of reality this story of reality is what um gives us security now the moment this is questioned this creates ontological insecurity and a cognitive dissonance this uh psychologists are finding out psychiatrists are finding out is actually as painful as physical pain mm. it's almost like somebody has taken a knife and run it through your body if mm. i tell you that your view of reality is actually a lie yep now it could be any view of reality it could be a view of reality that comes through religion or through nationalism the moment you find out there's something wrong with it it disturbs you you can't sleep at night you know you don't feel good anymore some people commit suicide it is so disturbing for some people so now the thing is you know i had a different uh, training on nature you could rather say i, I had a na- my nature is to look at hard things i have the ability to look at hard things and to look for truth or as far as one can achieve uh, the true picture of reality even if it f- makes me feel deeply uncomfortable i was willing to face up to it i think discomfort is the key to learning more exactly you have to get out of your comfort zone to learn anything it will make you uncomfortable to look at these facts but you have to say okay what is reality how close can i get to the truth however much closer i can get i should do it and you should have courage so the first even the greeks believe that the first virtue which is required for all their other cardinal virtues the greeks had four or five cardinal virtues but the first virtue is courage because without courage you can't do anything yeah you have so many podcasts in you <laughs> most and so <laughs> <laughs> we got to we got to come, come back. back exactly come yeah, back come I back th- so let's get back to zarathustra because he is the dude he is the original man he is the first prophet mm. as i explained to you in fact the jews and the christians and the muslims owe to him because he is the first guy who's saying look i'm i brought a message from god um god is ahura mazda as i said and the story begins from there because it's actually asura mazda because they don't have the word as i said sindhu becomes hindu mm. the name comes from persia yeah. because the river sindhu they could not pronounce the s so they changed it to h similarly ahura mazda now ahura mazda is this god but he has two forms two uh, natures in the original zoroastrianism i i have to give some context to the listeners here sure um so basically if you study things like the vishnu puran or shiv puran they talk about devas and asuras as being uh, two enemies yeah. So again, I've tried digging up the truth through the podcast, and what I've figured is, devas, as we call it, were probably a set of kings or uh, leaders of tribes on this side, which is geographically India, 
and asuras could have been kings on that side of the indus which is very likely persia and even if you actually study the asura culture in the puranas you'll see that even they prayed to the same gods like shiva like vishnu brahma etc so my reading here is that for us as indians but they were the enemies and for them as persians we were the enemies and you know even if you read the vishnu puran eventually the asuras and the devas also work together but let me just clarify one thing uh, shiva is not a vedic god mm. shiva is a god who emerges later is uh, therefore there are you know pashupati that seal that has been found yeah. which which we call the pashupati seal as the image of that yogi with the uh, bull's horns yeah yeah and we say that that might have been say a proto shiva mm. but he's not found in the vedic pantheon the rigvedic pantheon the closest we can find is rudra as a cognate of shiva that is we find indra there we find agni we find mitra but we do not find uh, shiva etc so um, and even vishnu is not the way we imagine vishnu vishnu actually is a in the original story is a dwarf a uh, divine one with who works with the gods so deva the uh, the roots of deva the etymological roots comes from the same root as deus deus in greek meaning god devas meaning devas also meaning the same thing the shining ones devas mm-hmm. who give off light and actually asuras also uh, were a divine being they mm-hmm. were not evil originally in the later versions they become uh, asuras become evil etc so ahura mazda therefore is not a bad he's a good force he's a god zoroaster is his prophet zarathustra and he also is predicting the birth actually of a of a, a a messianic leader who will come after him born from a virgin so so you can see that that there the, the christian myth is already there in what zarathustra is saying wow and zarathustra is also saying that look there is good there is evil these are these two forces the the forces of light and darkness they fight with each other in creation and in the end of course light will win over also he talks about the day of judgment and he also talks about heaven and hell so he's given you the basic framework of judaism christianity and islam this year is this in roughly we don't know exactly could be around 1000 bce could be up and up or down a little bit um, and so he's given us hell heaven and hell he has given us the day of judgment the basics of islam also the basics of christianity and judaism he has given us all of these things and it makes sense that the jews were actually slaves in babylon so they were exposed to this story uh, nebuchadnezzar the second had enslaved and taken them there and uh, cyrus the great freed them so they they were familiar with this story you see and therefore you can find fragments of that in their own versions and that's how they also write down the story they start their written scriptures appear only after that not before that and moses was when so again we don't have any physical evidence of moses no historical evidence just like we don't of jesus moses is the uh, origins of judaism origins one version of the story the other so there are two now scholars believe that these were two independent stories one origin story is of abraham so one group and they believe this could be the group that went to babylon and some were enslaved in egypt the ones which were enslaved in egypt jews have moses as their original origin story as their leader as their prophet etc the other group has abraham why don't you do a bit of a 101 of uh, jewish history or just very quick so people understand even judaism because i feel it has a very key role to play in this story as well sure so um, so coming just i'm just going to uh, dovetail it into the zarathustra story zarathustra uh, uh, once he emerges as a prophet uh, he changes iran's religion but not completely as i mentioned fire still continues to be an integral part of that religion and um, many of the rites are there after him this religion develops different sects two of the most prominent sects are manichaeism of Zara, of zoroastrianism manichaeism and mazdakism manichaeism believes again in two forces good and evil and they fight with each other and you see this good and evil is very interesting because the evil part that is uh, ahriman is the force of darkness and evil in in zoroastrianism he is actually the prototype of satan of devil shaitan he has exactly those qualities so you can see how this is coming into others other religions also from there right interesting and 
the good guy is actually another name for aura mazda the that is ordsman you know i don't know how, i don't know how to pronounce this name uh but is uh, uh, so the, uh, and then you have these two forces of good and evil black and white that's why we say don't be mannequin when we say in english we mean don't see the world only in black and white mm. the world is gray it's not just black and white so but it comes from that uh, one of the sects of zoroastrian now judaism has very complex origins and it's not actually clear uh, what it is they are clearly again a semitic people semitic people being the peop- uh, two three branches one is the arabs that is the arabic language the other semitic language is hebrew and the third semitic language which many people believe is the berber language spoken in north africa you know the berbers in um, morocco morocco in algeria etc so these semitic people some people who lived in this area which is now israel palestine in those days there used to be different names by semitic you mean jewish this is how we perceive it now but actually technically the term semitic means arab and jewish okay. so when you say uh, but because in europe the only semitic people that existed were jews so we say oh semitic is jew anti semitic is anti jewish so, but so actually technically arabic and hebrew are sister languages they are distinct from the indo european group they are a different group of languages it's called the semitic group of languages today when we say the word semitic it usually means jewish but historically it means probably kind of arab yeah correct so they are both they are cousins so they are they are part of the same group okay. semitic group so these people were most likely um like everybody everywhere else their main religion was animistic uh, pagan they worshiped uh, you know various things various kind of idols now at some point the idea of one god took over and as i said one version could have been coming from zarathustra but see nothing is coming out from nothing even egypt some of the egyptian pharaohs also had this concept of one god okay ramses etc so they that they should be one god now there is a technical term for this there is slight differences one is monotheism there's a second term called henotheism henotheism says that you believe in a supreme god they can be subordinate gods many gods but you believe in one superior god or supreme god that is henotheism the term coined by max muller the german uh, scholar so so slowly this I, you don't make a transition from so many gods to one god in one shot you have many gods and from there you have one god with subordinate gods and then slowly the subordinate gods disappear and you have one god so you make a gradual this transition over thousands of years hundreds or thousands whatever yeah depending on your circumstances okay, okay. so the so the jews <clears throat> made this transition at some point you know slowly and um, they claim that they had this leader called moses on this side and abraham on this side of course there are no records just like actually we don't have any records even for say the buddha or even for jesus in their lifetimes there is no record of these people uh these are um you know we don't know exactly who they were we can't say with uh, precision what the uh, written record says because um just the court keeping was not that advanced and we don't have uh, uh, surviving records for these people so we tried a lot uh, to find evidence for moses in, in fact israeli scholars have tried a lot israeli archaeologists historians but they have found no evidence so far or for abraham um but these two different origin stories emerge abraham and his children you know isaac and ishmael that is isaac is supposed to be the ancestor of uh, the jews ishmael is supposed to be the ancestor of the arabs this is the arab version of it the jews only consider themselves to be children of isaac but there's the other story that no we are the children of uh, we are or we are part of the group which was led by moses and his uh, son aaron so there are these different origin stories are there but at some point you have uh, this kingdom emerges okay uh, we have some uh, evidence of one of the jewish prophets so many right there's king david the guy who was small and defeated the goliath, goliath mm-hmm. the giant and then his son solomon in in islam we say daud and suleiman from from what i understand here and this is from my childhood okay so we used to have book fairs and my mum wanted to get me into reading and i didn't read i used to actually watch a lot of tv shows and it was a great decision by the way i learned a lot either way 
she wanted me to understand christianity so she bought me a children's version of the bible that had the new testament which had all of uh, jesus christ stories and christianity in general and it had the old testament mm. uh, which was all the stories related to judaism mm. and that book had a huge impact on how i perceive mm. general world history because you learn so much about hinduism buddhism yeah. jainism sikhism here uh you even learn about islam mm-hmm. in our history books mm. you don't really learn about christianity and judaism they very so, important yeah, yeah. And so i i got to learn about judaism through the old testament mm. and of course christianity through the new testament and as i grew older i realized that people don't talk about the old testament anymore mm. in the modern world mm-hmm. even even christians talk primarily about the new testament mm. so what i understand about judaism is that mm. it's a collection of learnings from the old testament in the same way that possibly hinduism is a collection of learning from all the scriptures that we have the vedas the upanishads mm. am i correct in saying it or is this so, a wrong yeah. thought no no you are you are pretty uh, accurate uh, the only correction i would make is that we don't use the term old testament anymore S- scholars use the word hebrew bible because otherwise it feels like oh they are old you know that is they are just another version and we are the new it tends to denote like old testament new testament the terminology tends to denote like this is more new and therefore it's more legitimate Should and it? you are old and you are therefore un- illegitimate but isn't old a good thing in some cases so i don't know but scholars <laughs> the scholars use the word hebrew bible now for that hebrew bible the hebrew bible so so yeah Ju- judaism is a collection of lessons and learnings from the hebrew bible you know the jewish religion that is judaism has an origin story like every religion and the origin story starts with adam eve etc you know we you know the story and then there are different prophets who come at different times um why does adam come again he is originally in paradise he is happy so is eve but they taste the forbidden fruit because the prehistory of that is that um god made made many angels but after that he made man and one of the angels refused to bow in front of man he said this is your creation why should i bow um that angel becomes that angel called lucifer becomes satan satan and he refuses to bow uh, shaitan shaitan correct I, i love how languages are so linked yeah. but anyway go on yeah but they are also semitic right so arabs also have the same root language as jews yeah, i i'd always Hebrew. question that how do my muslim friends know so much about the old testament mm. now as i've grown older i've understood that oh okay there are old testament lessons across christianity judaism islam and they're respected lessons yeah and i mean there are there are slight differences in these lessons i'll also explain that they're not exactly the same but yeah the origin story is again coming from judaism <laughs> in the same way that zoroastrianism which is parsis uh and modern day hindus kind of have a common seed religion which we don't even know about mm, mm. because it probably was a very elaborate religion which is now lost mm, you know mm, because mm. of time yeah, yeah. and uh zoroastrians think their religion is the most ancient hindus think their religion is the most ancient but there's probably a seed religion which is more ancient which we don't know about yeah. we don't know what it was and called. even hinduism that we talk of today is not actually the the vedic religion the mm. vedic religion is different right hinduism mm. also because the vedic religion is as i told you the gods are different you know indra mitra varuna mm. agni whereas today now the chief gods are different they are actually vishnu shiva mm. so uh, and their avatars you know mm. uh, etc so it's a very different religion from what the vedic now we have temples they had no temples they had only the fire sacrifice mm. so it's a very different religions also change over period of time yeah. in the same way the abrahamic religions um maybe they had some other ancient ancestor origin religion uh, which followed aspects of the old testament as i told you their their original ancient uh, religion is basically either zoroastrianism or some forms of egyptian religion that is at some different points of time egypt also had monotheism in different dynasties so their roots could have come from there because we know that the jews and the arabs both were pagans they were both animistic people we know that i thought i knew so much about religion so i'm grateful for this podcast i've mm. got to learn so much man <laughs> not the end of the episode just this is side brotherly compliment thanks thanks but uh, really? let's let's go on yeah. let's go on so so they have their uh, to the uh, jews have their origin story um god, uh, god has told them not to eat this apple etc and they eat the apple uh, because in the form of a snake satan has poisoned their minds they lose their innocence they are 
kicked out of Eden. That is why Milton's famous poem, Paradise Lost, they're thrown on the earth. Then they have children and they reproduce and you have different prophets who come at different time, including Noah, who saved the world from this flood and so on and so forth. You know the story. And then finally you come to one origin story goes towards Abraham. One goes towards Moses. And they believe now, the scholars believe that these could be different origin stories because actually the Jews had been split into two kingdoms at one point. Right? Israel was one. And then Zion was one. And so on and so forth. And at different times, there are two kingdoms and there are one kingdom and two kingdoms, etc. How do you know so much? <laughs> like, how do you, like, it's books? So all my life, what I've done is, yeah, partly uh, that, is that I've followed questions which, so I had two things, as I told you. I was a very curious kid, you know. I was curious I, and things troubled me until I knew the secret, you know. And you, you're able to retain all this? I guess I have some ADD in which... Um, which constrains me in some ways. That is, um, maybe I can't write papers as fast as people do. But one thing I was gifted with was a decent memory. You know, so I could I could remember, especially things which touched me or which uh, which I was eager to learn or curious or emotional about. You know, you're built for this medium, by the way. Probably, <laughs> you know, you're you're talking about not writing papers like it's a curse, but <laughs> this is the flip side yeah, of it. Yeah, for an academic, it can be a curse, but yeah, you you, you need someone to just hold you down and ask you questions, <laughs> which is what we're doing. But, <laughs> Thanks, Rami. But uh, go on, go on. Yeah. So you have these prophets coming and um, they believe that, yeah, as I told you, that we believe that maybe these were two different origin stories of two different kingdoms of Jews. Uh, that is the Abraham story and the Moses story. And that's why they are both very important stories. <sighs> Their children are different kinds of prophets. And then finally, you arrive at the kings of these kingdoms. So one is King David. You have... He also becomes a prophet and he gets also a, not every prophet gets scripture. So uh, a prophet is a messenger of God. God gives him a message. But not every messenger of God has a written script and a written text, a scripture. So Moses has, say, the Torah, he gives the law. Basically, it's the law of the Jews. The Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Uh, uh, David has the Psalms of David. Mm. Right? And Psalm so Solomon, is like a poem. Poem of Solomon and uh, David. So you each, but some prophets don't get a written text. So in Arabic, the word used for prophet is Nabi. Nabi is just the messenger of God. These are all Nabis. They acknowledge the Nabis which came before. Rasul are prophets who have been given a scripture. So Moses is a Rasul. Uh, Prophet Muhammad is a Rasul. Rasul is one who gets the scripture from God. So basically a way of also saying that, okay, this culture is now uh, literate. It is, uh, has script. Uh, um, so, but what happens is, as I told you, after the, uh, the Torah is probably an oral tradition, but after Cyrus the Great and after the return from Babylon, it becomes a written tradition. The Jews have their own kingdoms, etc. Then the Romans conquer them. Then the second expulsion happens. Uh, uh, the Romans, af after the second or third revolt, the Romans kick all of them out. The temple, which was the center of their uh, religious life, gets uh, destroyed. And this, where does this temple come from? Is very interesting. Does it have Zoroastrian origins, this temple? Or is it something else? Uh, finally, um, um, you find that Jews are dispersed in a diaspora across the Middle East, across North Africa, Europe, and including Central Asia. Uh, by this time, uh, Christianity has emerged. Christianity actually, coming to Christianity, what is Christianity? Christian, Christians originally are a sect of Judaism. Because who was Jesus? He was a Jew. Who were his main followers? They were all Jews. Uh, Peter, Paul, all these people were Jews. But what happens is two, two three things happen. <clears throat> It becomes a religion of salvation. What does that mean? Um, that is how to save your soul. You know, how to go to heaven, how to redeem yourself, how to... Um, um, so, so, now, Jews don't accept Jesus as a prophet or as a messiah. Or, 
even though there is a tradition that a messiah will come among as, the jews as in the other jewish sects don't mm. accept this particular yeah. messiah the vast majority of them don't accept him as a messiah though okay. there is a tradition in judaism that a messiah will come who will save us who will restore us you know because our kingdom has been destroyed we have defeated people this messiah will come he'll restore us etc so that means that the modern day jews still think that there's a messiah who's yet to come yes and they don't accept jesus as that filler in the film the black exactly and by the way the messiah has been predicted all the way back by zarathustra that's interesting because zarathustra said that a guy will come he'll you know save the world and uh, he'll be born of a virgin all these things are already there in kind of you know so you okay. can see that actually the way stories and myths emerge they have a life of their own and they continue in different forms you know what we have the internet now and a hindu is learning about islam a sikh is learning about christianity a jain is learning about judaism uh probably geographically speaking back then when modern day religions were originating abrahamic religions were originating people didn't have access to this quantity of information obviously there was no internet back then so my question is again about the messiahs that how did people readily agree to uh other people saying that okay i'm the messenger of god and i'm sure there was resistance also faced as uh, we believe that as people moved from hunter gatherer to settle agriculture their means of production that is their technology changed agriculture is a totally different technology just like industrial organization industry is totally different industrial revolution changed our means of production and technology so that also changes your society and your culture and your religion and you start finding evidence of what is now a controversial term called the axial age okay so a, a, a while ago um people used to ter term this period as the axial age that is the transition towards higher civilization so civilization begins with agriculture why do we say that simple reason before agriculture everybody has to work to get food etc so you have a flat tribal structure of society that's a and everybody is involved in the production of food and clothes and everything once agriculture comes a small percentage of the population is freed from the need to work for food because the farmers are producing enough grains or or sheep or cattle whatever to feed uh, everybody so now you will have specialized roles a warrior a priest a bureaucrat tax collector king etc aristocrat so you have now a more hierarchical society which is not a good thing but also a more productive society so more is available for people population also explodes increases because now more people can live on a square piece of land but also it leads to culture that is people can now devote themselves entirely to say producing literature and song we will philosophy get philosophy painting people can do uh, pottery more specialized uh, jewelry making uh, different things can emerge so you have development of what is called now slowly what happens is also the complexity of your society is increasing society is becoming more complex different kinds of people slaves this that different also society is becoming larger because now your technology with the copper age and metal iron age etc you now have the technology to farm larger areas and to make larger armies with more weapons you can conquer more territory so you from having villages or city states you now have kingdoms maybe even empires this completely changes this complexity and size completely changes your need for religion now the old religion is not satisfying why because the old religion was actually a tribal religion it was a cult it was a um, maybe um, you had a totem you know a tribal totem like in we have in tribes or you had something which was a smaller thing but the other tribe had a different cult it had a different but you have now part of the same system you're part of the same say city state or kingdom or empire so you need something more universal your morality cannot be only for your tribe because each religion also comes with a morality it comes with a value system it comes with economics a certain economic system but if you have so many different ones you will ha have chaos and you will have conflict and how will you trade and how will you be part of the same empire which, so, which i feel is what's happening today as well yeah. where so many people are talking about spirituality they say i'm spiritual not religious but this uh, is actually the formation of a new religion uh, where, but but the problem is that uh, and the good thing is uh, about the present moment is that we have separated to some extent our economics and our law from our religion 
in the ancient world it was not like this so we have a we have a legal code a criminal uh, code a civil code you know ipc etc we have uh, uh, laws for economics and trade how you're going to so countries are the new religion country nationalism is the new religion yes i'll come to that <laughs> we'll come to that nationalism is a form of religion actually wow. and i'll come to that how it is but that's a whole different discussion it'll take an hour to explain that that's another podcast yeah, that's another <laughs> podcast so so we have separated our religious beliefs from how we do our civil administration our economics our business but in the ancient world it was not like that it was part of the same system your religion and your economics and your political system they all went together in fact some people believe that the the reason for religion was actually this that is how do you interact with a stranger suppose you follow the same religion then you will be at peace otherwise in hunter gatherer societies if two strangers met each other they perceived such a huge threat from each other that immediately the action could become very violent because culture was so different culture was so different and there was a threat because you didn't because your values and your expectations were different you were basically like two different animals who are facing each other in the forest for the first time you don't know what to expect from him but once you have the same culture and the same religion and the same values because they come from the same then you know what to expect and you trust each other you will not immediately indulge in violence you will maybe trade so religion becomes a kind of way of also re- reducing the threat from the other and increasing trade and interaction cultural interaction etc okay so as you become bigger you need a, a religion which is more common to more people and whose values are u- more universal that is it can't be that because i am from this ethnicity i don't value your life as equal for example no we are both have to have something in common so say for example we are both human beings we say we are both human beings we both have the same values and hence now we can now exist in the same system in terms of economics politics culture etc but for that you need the same value system so therefore you need the same beliefs about reality about god about ultimate ends about so therefore you need a common religion so as society is becoming bigger uh more complex you need a common religion for practical purposes but for another purpose also that is some people now have free time compared to others these elites in the society they are now indulging in more sophisticated thought about what are the ultimate ends of life what does life mean what is beyond this life what are the goals for a person who is struggling every day for survival these ultimate ends are not important questions he or she is struggling every day with the battles of the day how to get food how to ensure my child survives if if the child dies or my relative dies how do i continue these things are the main things which are occupying your mind for that any kind of a local cult would suffice you know you're not so worried. but but then you get more deeper so some people used to call these movements the axial age the axial age being the age in which you move from one set of religions which are these earlier religions to a more sophisticated way of religions that is what are the most sophisticated religions vedant the vedantic religion ved ka ant vedant that is you know the more upanishadic religion more abstract thought or buddhism is another example of a developed axial religion you know more abstract thought more worried about ultimate goals a universal morality not a tribal morality morality for all human beings uh, ultimate goals so these are the axial age religion another example for example is judaism judaism develops as a more okay universalistic rather than a tribalistic religion more a universalistic morality as moses gives in the 10 commandments thou shall not do this thou shall not do that and so these are developing almost um, within a thousand years of each other in the same kind of time period roughly you know confucius in china gives you so these are called axial age religions right now we don't use the term axial anymore also because it is kind of discredited because earlier it was believed that this happened in a very narrow period of time like maybe within 2 3 4 5 hundred years of each other but now we have realized that actually it's much longer it this in different civilizations this happened at different times because different civilizations went through agriculture empire building at different times mm. so it this could have been spread over a thousand or even 2000 years because the middle east developed and china developed earlier than other parts developed later so depending on when your part of the world went from agriculture to civilization you went from the 
proto religions from the early religions which could be ancestor worship or paganism or whatever animism totem worship to these axial thought another very famous axial thought is zoroastrianism another one which we find is the religion or the philosophy of plato and socrates and i'll explain how that also is like an axial religion even though it's a philosophy it's not about so god it's talking about the meaning of life it's what talking about it? ultimate ends exactly it's talking about uh, a universal morality mm. plato and aristotle are talking about universal morality they're talking about um, how to set up a state so now you're dealing with much bigger questions which would be required in a more sophisticated kingdom empire etc um, so so to with judaism zoroastrianism vedantism vedantism the upanishadic religion which is more abstract you know it's about um, monism meditation it is very different from the vedic religion which is basically about sacrifice mm. ancestors gods you know it's this is a more abstract religion right and similarly buddhism also a more abstract religion so it depends on the stage of civilization that you are that your religion also and your tech, according to your technology becomes more sophisticated your means of governance also becomes more sophisticated and that's why modern religions are even more different because now technology has changed more our societies have changed even more and similarly our politics has also changed we have other forms like democracy etc these are also technologies but technologies of governance mm. politics is a kind of technology of governance just as these new age religions that you talk about these are technologies of spiritual satisfaction new technology technology comes from the greek word technike technike means the way of doing something it can be applied to mechanical things it can be applied to electronic things it can be applied to politics governance religion society why did suddenly prophets start appearing among the jewish people only it's a very strange question a very strange occurrence the reason is that judaism was going the jewish people were undergoing a technological transformation a social transformation culture they are for the first time becoming a proper kingdom with proper systems in place i told you the judea kingdoms samara judea you know um israel zion whatever you want to call it at one stage they are one and then they become two and then they become one and two again um so you are now beginning to have a sophisticated uh, uh uh people arising now what this these tribal cults that they had and the local gods that they have baal was a famous god the calf the golden calf which they worship which moses tells them to not worship this calf anymore he comes down from the mountain etc these are all tribal cults you know maybe it was a totem of a tribe you know the calf the golden calf etc i don't know what it was exactly but what happens is now they start saying no there has to be something beyond this we have to also unite into one people as one kingdom as i mentioned um and this is not satisfying also to some people you know who have more time to think about this so they are looking for something more up more abstract and so this concept of yahwa emerges yahwa being the supreme god who is unseen in fact his even name cannot be mentioned we are saying yahweh but we don't know what yahweh whether they actually use the word because he's so sacred that his name also cannot be mentioned a kind of a predecessor to allah or god yahweh emerges and so if uh, such a god emerges some new laws have to be given for this new god and these prophets are messengers are coming from time to time and you know serving both as community leaders as moral educators and also you have to realize that at this point there is no judicial system there is no judges there is no supreme court and all of that so these prophets serve as judges also they are giving laws they are serving as judges they are serving as leaders in times of war they are serving as uh, guides you know mm. um and um uh so we do actually so as i said to you we don't have actually physical evidence of either moses or abraham or anybody okay these could also be stories which have been made in retrospect to justify your tribal identity your ethnic identity we do have evidence of solomon etc these later prophet who is a king also solomon david etc and they are also considered prophets so we do have some evidence little bit fragmentary evidence of that and then we come to again um, um so this tradition continues but it continues in a very narrow area the area of this israel palestine this uh, whatever up uh, uh, levant uh jesus emerges also in this area the jews don't accept him we don't have actually really any contemporary evidence for jesus also the first mentions of jesus are already you know 60 or even 
later uh, ce common era that is uh, what would earlier be called 60 ad 70 ad you know before that there's no real mention at all and in fact even then there is mention only of this uh, new cult that has emerged one of the historians josephus etc they mention so this new cult emerged so we don't find any contemporary records of jesus which is surprising because the romans were very good record keepers we have records of lots of stuff even the egyptians were not bad at record keeping actually maybe it was erased in order to stop the spread of christianity at that time it was hardly spreading so um but record would anyway be there right so the story is that jesus is is caught by pontius pilate the roman uh, governor there and then he's crucified etc but no such records have been found contemporary there's no such records of of such a preacher teaching also so we don't have records of this kind but again he fits into a a tradition pre-existing among the these people the jewish people that is a prophetic tradition mm. right and and again it's a time of hardship so a, a messiah would be more than welcome to save them from this roman occupation and oppression um so um so to your answer why such messiahs were coming up and why were they accepted by people this is the long answer it includes many things no this is it's a nice answer. it also explains the need for religion uh it explains a lot of modern day governance tricks if the relevant audience is listening mm in terms of if you want to influence a large group of people right Yeah, these are. And the, in fact, our politicians do that too. Yeah, exactly. They are, they are like modern day uh, it's, prophets. It's, it's a huge reason I don't like following politics. Yeah, because uh, once you know the macro timelines of the human story, you realize that these people also know about those timelines and are simply using these tricks mm. to control large masses of people. Mm. Uh, and in saying that, I'm a big fan of religion. Almost like mm. I look at the spiritual side of like all these religions, and I feel there's so much beautiful stuff to gain. Mm. or maybe that's just me trying to settle my overactive mind there is a lot of beautiful stuff but there's a lot of ugly stuff also and a lot of conflict also in every religion you know every podcast i do leaves me with a kind of emotion this one's left me with that whole thing about i feel like i picked up the rock from the top of an iceberg <laughs> almost like a whole iceberg yeah, yeah, yeah. to discover yeah. so uh just going to say i'm looking forward to speaking to you more um we had scheduled you as a guest in order to learn more about islam and have that put on the show as well especially from a historical perspective from a spiritual perspective uh but we've gained even more than just one topic you know i feel you're truly like a polymath and lots to dig up in that add <laughs> inflicted mind so yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you for being yeah. here mohsin sir thank you and you it was a pleasure and i've learned from you no, i'm to- glad lots lots more to uh, talk about That's great so that was the information packed episode for today when i read the book sapiens by yuval noah harari i felt similar to how you're probably feeling at this point after listening to this episode when you learn about history in this much detail it kind of changes your viewpoint on day to day life when you next hear about religious conflicts in the news when you're at a party the next time and you witness the interaction between people when you witness people gossiping you're going to look at the world differently possibly because of this conversation reading sapiens had a very impactful effect on me and meeting mohsin raza khan had another impactful effect he's going to be back on the show a lot i'm sure that from this episode you guys have now figured what mohsin sir is capable of sharing with the trs audience so in the comments down below give us your feedback on this episode we have an entire special coming up on islam with mohsin raza khan i highly recommend everyone checks that out We've recorded one episode out of that series, and it was fantastic, as information packed as this one was. Need you guys to show TRS support in 2023 for making it all about inter-religious studies from a historical perspective, at least to begin 2023. And I just want to thank you for helping us and supporting us through this fantastic year. Keep supporting us. Follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Make sure you download level link is given down below and Ranbir and the team will see you soon.